Hi, everybody. Today, we're going to continue talking about those fascinating early years of Lil Hardin Armstrong in Chicago. So after that day with Jelly Roll Morton, more and more people would come in and ask to hear the Lil Miss thing. They gave her a raise, big $5 a week. But Lillian started asking Mrs. Jones, who occasionally booked bands in the area, if she could place her with a band. Now, mind you, Lillian's mother still had no idea what she was doing. And one day, a band comes in. It was Lawrence Doohy and his Creole jazz band. And they came in, they were from New Orleans, and wanted to get some gigs in Chicago. She found them some work. <clears throat> but the work that she found, which was in a Chinese restaurant, had a lot of singers that were involved with this particular gig. They needed a piano player. Now, this is fascinating to me because pianos really weren't a part of these hot jazz bands that were coming out of New Orleans. They started out as marching bands, and so you had to have instruments that could be easily transported around. You know, banjos and horn sections and uh, tubas, no piano. So here they were in a situation, they needed a piano. Mrs. Jones sends over a number of piano players. They didn't like any of them. They felt that they played too, too much of a Chicago style, which I think meant too bluesy. And out of desperation, she sends in Lil Hardin. Lil Hardin describes this situation where she walks into this Chinese restaurant, ready to start this gig, and she turns to the band leader and says, um, what selection will we be playing and what key are we in? And he just looked at her and he said, we don't have any music and I don't know any key. Just when you hear two knocks, meaning two stamps on the floor, come on in. And that was the all direction that he gave her. Musicians out there will certainly recognize this was one of those situations where the band leader was giving her a little hoop to jump through. Because certainly, even musicians that didn't read music knew what key their songs were in. But anyway, somehow Lillian figured out what key they were in and managed with that great driving rhythm style that really wasn't over-embellished, that helped the band stay together and acted as glue for the band, really impressed them, and they hired her and she suddenly had a gig. She did this for three months at the cost of twenty-two fifty a week, and when her mother finally found out about this thing, okay, this was a big, a big scandal. Dempsey insisted that she quit this job immediately, that she go back to school, that she finish her music degree, and Lillian broke down crying and said, "Look, all that's really ahead for me, after everything that you dreamed up for me." is that I will be a cook or I'll be somebody's maid. Don't you want something better for me? And to her credit, Dempsey, who really did believe this music was the devil's music, allowed her to stay in the band. But she would pick her up every night at one o'clock and escort her home, which was so embarrassing to Lillian, but she agreed to the arrangement. So I don't really have a music recommendation for you guys for this week, but I really have a great book recommendation. We don't often get such in-depth um, research about some of these women composers, but this is a really wonderfully researched book by James Dickerson called Just for a Thrill, and it is um, the life and times of Lil Hardin Armstrong, the first lady of jazz. I had to hunt this down. I found a remaindered copy from a library online. You'll, you'll have to scout around for it, but really, really fantastic story, not only about her, but really about those halcyon days, earliest days of jazz. If you're really liking hearing about these stories, please share this link and this channel with your friends. Urge them to become subscribers. Uh, we're getting a lot of great feedback about these episodes and hope to keep this good thing going on.